The portion of God's word that we'll focus on this morning comes from Acts chapter 2. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Imagine that you have just been hired to work in a carpentry shop. At your first day on the job, your boss assigns you the task of building a beautiful, custom-made cabinet. You're so excited for your first project that you go and you gather up the necessary lumber, and you go and ask your boss where they keep all the tools. Your boss responds, Yeah, um... Maybe we should have told you this before, but yeah, we don't actually have any tools here. I'm really expecting a top-notch cabinet out of you, though. And so on your next day at work, you bring some of your own tools in. You bring your own saws and things like that. And when you get ready to, to plug one in, your boss taps you on the shoulder and says, Yeah, um, we don't have electrical outlets here either. Um, but I'm really excited to see your finished product. You'd quit that job, wouldn't you? You'd quit that job because you didn't feel like you were properly equipped to carry out the assigned task that you were asked to do. You wouldn't feel like you had the necessary tools or the power that you needed to do that job. And so if you didn't have that stuff, well, it'd feel pretty futile to even bother trying, right? You ever feel that way about doing evangelism? about sharing Jesus with others? You feel like you've been turned down so many times by your friends or your neighbors or your coworkers when you try and tell them about Jesus that it sort of feels like you're spinning your wheels? And you start to wonder if maybe God left out some really important tool that he could have given you to, to make the job a lot easier. And you wonder maybe why God didn't empower you with more eloquence or charisma or wisdom so you could get the job done. You wonder, am I even cut out for this? And when our evangelism efforts, they seem like they fail, or they seem like sort of you're just spinning your wheels, there's really one of four ways that we can respond. We can get frustrated and quit. We can get afraid of sharing Jesus and quit. We can grow apathetic and quit. Or we can keep trusting in God and keep sharing Jesus no matter what the results might seem. Now, obviously, as your pastor, it's my prayer that all of us would choose that last option. And I think Pentecost helps us to do that. Because as we're going to see from God's word today, Pentecost empowers your purpose. The festival of Pentecost reminds us what our purpose is in this life as Christians. And it assures us that God has provided for us all of the tools and all the power that we need to faithfully and joyfully carry out that purpose that he's given to us. For about 50 days after Easter, Jesus' followers had been living in the epitome of joy because Jesus was alive. Over a span of 40 days, Jesus kept appearing to them to comfort them and and to teach them just like he always had before. And as we heard about last week, on that 40th day, Jesus ascends back into heaven, his work of salvation completed. And we're told that at that point, his followers returned to Jerusalem with great joy, staying continually at the temple, praising God, obeying the command that Jesus gave to his followers before he ascended into heaven, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father promised. And so all the believers are there. They join together constantly in prayer, reminding each other of God's love and eagerly anticipating that gift that the Father was going to send. And can you blame them? Can you blame them for living with that kind of joy when they knew that their Savior was alive and that he had ascended back into heaven to take back the full use of his power and glory as God so that he could rule over everything in the universe for their good? Their only desire was to just bask in the joy of Jesus that filled their hearts and had changed their lives. Now maybe we look at that body of believers and we say, that right there, 
That's what the church should be. That's what, how we should be living, what we should be doing. And it's certainly a beautiful picture, isn't it? To see believers enjoying and sharing the unity they have through their faith in Jesus. But if believers only pay attention and focus to fellow believers, then God's purpose for his church is only half completed. Because we hear that before Jesus ascended into heaven, he commissioned his followers, go and make disciples of all nations. He told them, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I wonder if those 11 men standing on a mountaintop, or the 120 total believers that there were at this time, I wonder if they fretted when they heard that. So they thought to themselves, how in the world are we supposed to reach the ends of the earth? We are not equipped for that purpose. And if God had left it entirely up to those disciples, they would have had every reason to make excuses and quit. Because on their own, they weren't empowered or equipped to carry out that purpose. But God wasn't going to leave them on their own. And so God set into motion an eternal plan, a plan that had been prophesied half a millennium earlier by the prophet Joel, a plan that would equip and empower his people to carry out their purpose to share Jesus with the world. Now, most people estimate that at this point in Jerusalem, there were somewhere between a half million to a million Jews from all over the world gathered together to celebrate what was called the Feast of Weeks, sometimes referred to as Pentecost. It was a harvest festival intended to thank God as the people prepared and gathered in their wheat harvest. But on this Pentecost, God had in mind a completely different kind of harvest, a harvest of souls. And everything was about to change. As was their custom, the believers were all together, praying and praising God, when suddenly what sounded like a hurricane-forced wind rushed down from heaven and filled the house where all of those believers were. And yet no wind actually blew. And as they stared wide-eyed at each other, they noticed that there were little tongues of fire appearing on each other's heads. And yet their hair didn't burn. And finally, these different foreign languages, they burst forth from their tongues, languages they had never spoken before. And this was the gift that the Father, that Jesus had promised he was going to send. Not the sound of wind, not the tongues of fire, not even the ability to suddenly speak foreign languages. No, those things were simply signals. Signals that showed that the Father's gift had arrived. The true gift of Pentecost that empowers and equips us is that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Like the sound of sirens often brings a crowd of gawkers down the street, the strange sounds of Pentecost also brought a, a curious crowd to that house. And as the perplexed onlookers gathered, a crowd made up of people, Jews from all over the known world, from Asia to Africa to Europe, as those people gathered together, their jaws hit the ground because each one heard them, the believers, speaking in his own language. And it wasn't like freshmen in German class struggling to pronounce even a single simple word. These believers were speaking these languages perfectly fluently. And so as these foreign Jews, they heard these strangers proclaiming the wonders of God's love through Christ in their own native languages, it became very clear that what was happening there was not normal. That this was something big, something new, something supernatural. And of course, there were some skeptics, some mockers who thought this must be the influence of wine, not the influence of the divine. And so Peter stands up to set the record straight. The same Peter who 52 days earlier had been so terrified of a little servant girl that he denied ever even knowing Jesus, he stands up to speak. Flanked on all sides by the other 11 apostles who also fled in fear and abandoned Jesus, he gets ready to speak. 
And he raises his voice so that the whole crowd can hear him. And he explains that what was happening there was not the wine talking. It was God speaking. Speaking through his messengers like never before. He told them that this was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made through the prophet Joel a half a millennium earlier. That he was going to empower and equip his people to carry out their purpose. The promise from God that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all people. And empowered by the spirit, the believers take this power and they put it to work immediately. Proclaiming the wonders of God and his love for the world through Christ in all these different foreign languages. Reaching people from all the ends of the earth without even having to leave Jerusalem. And Peter proclaims this message, pointing the crowd to the scriptures to tell them the truth about Jesus. And miraculously, we're told that 3,000 people were brought to faith on that one single day. That's 25 times more people on that one day than the 120 believers that believed before Pentecost. It's a miracle. It's an amazing miracle. And maybe you're wondering to yourselves, well, Pastor, how come your sermons aren't as good as Peter's, that you can't convert 3,000 people all at once? First of all, that's a little bit mean. (laughs) And secondly, it wasn't about Peter. And you wonder, how did these formerly flaky, fragile followers of Jesus suddenly transform themselves into such faithful messengers for God? It wasn't about them. It was all about the Holy Spirit, the powerful transformational spirit with whom God filled his people like never before. The spirit who changed everything, who empowered and equipped God's people to carry out their purpose, to fearlessly and faithfully proclaim a resurrected Christ to an unbelieving world. And that's why a a Pentecost day that took place two millennia ago is so vitally important for us as 21st century Christians. Because Pentecost reminds us what our purpose is as believers. It reminds us that we don't have to be afraid or apathetic of sharing the gospel. Because as God promises, in the last days, the time between Pentecost and Judgment Day, God pours out his Holy Spirit on all people, sons and daughters, young men and old men, both men and women. In the past, God would pour out his Spirit on his chosen prophets and they would be his mouthpiece to speak to the people on his behalf. But in these last days, God calls all people, regardless of our age or our gender or our race or our, so- our social standing, to be his messengers and take Christ to the unbelieving world. And that's why we never have to stop evangelizing, whether from fear or apathy or frustration. Because Pentecost reminds us that God has given us all of the tools and all of the power that we need to accomplish his purposes. Last week I was shaving. I had shaved about half of my face with an electric trimmer when I heard it in my hand start to slow down and and start to sputter. So I rushed as quickly as I could to shave the other half of my face so I didn't have to come to church with a a half-shaven face. And I barely made it in time. That tool almost let me down because it almost ran out of power. But the tool that God gives us when we carry out evangelism, it never fails and it never runs out of power. The tool he gives us to do evangelism is his word. And the prophet Isaiah, speaking and writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reminds us, so is the word that comes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. See, the Spirit working through the word never fails to accomplish God's purposes, never fails to carry out God's will. And isn't that incredibly comforting for us when we think about doing evangelism, sharing Jesus with others? Because that tells us that when we share the word of God with other people, it's never futile. 
It's never just us spinning our wheels because the Spirit is always working through it and God's will is always accomplished. Because when we share the Word of God, we are using a tool that is unimaginably powerful. And to tap into that power, we don't have to be the world's most eloquent speaker or the world's wisest scholar. We just simply have to proclaim the wonders of God and the Spirit does the rest. And that's why we can always trust in God and keep on sharing Christ. Because through our message, God's will is always done. His purpose is always accomplished. And God always works through that to share his message. Even if we don't witness it, even if we don't see the results with our own eyes, God's will is always done. But why us? Why didn't God just keep using the, the angels? I mean, they did a pretty bang-up job at Christmas and at Easter, right? Why us? Why would God choose such stumbling, fearful messengers who so often quit or grow apathetic or lose the courage to speak? Why would God choose sinful messengers like us or the apostles to share Jesus with the world? But which do you think would be a more compelling account? An account of D-Day written by a World War II veteran who stormed Normandy's beaches and survived, or by a college student who wasn't even born until five decades later? Why us? Because we're living the message that we proclaim. Because we know what it feels like to be stung when the Spirit convicts us of our sin and our failure to keep God's law. Because we know the utter joy that it feels like to be convinced by the Spirit that our forgiveness and our eternal life are certain through faith in Christ. Because we know firsthand what it feels like to live a life of hatred and blind ignorance towards God's love. Only to have the Spirit shatter the stony, unbelieving hearts in us. And to give us spiritual sight through hearts of faith that fully grasp God's perfect love for the world in Jesus. Because only a person that has felt the pain of starvation can truly appreciate being fed. Because only a person who has found food can know the utter joy that it is to point another starving person to the one where they can be filled. We have been filled, brothers and sisters in Christ. Filled by God's Holy Spirit so that we are empowered and equipped to share God's word without fear or frustration or apathy. Your witness of the world is always powerful because God is always working through it. And through that, God's will is always done because the Holy Spirit is always working. So be filled brothers and sisters in Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing. It's like a, a pitcher of water pouring water into a cup. And as that cup gets fuller and fuller, eventually it overflows and pours the water into everything around it. In the same way as we are continuously filled with the Spirit through the Word of God, through baptism, through Holy Communion, <clears throat> and the Spirit is going to overflow out of us and flood into everything and everyone around us. So brothers and sisters in Christ, trust in God. Be filled. And keep sharing Jesus. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which goes beyond all human understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.